I want to make sure that anyone online can see this as well. I want to recommend a book to you tonight uh, in light of what we're going to talk about. It's called Slaying Leviathan by Glenn Sunshine. It's a tremendous book that gives an overview of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. It's very approachable. It's very readable. I think it's very biblical and very fair. So I want to encourage you to check that out. Um, Also, there's some other resources I could recommend to you, but that's the one that I would encourage you to start with. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at a variety of New Testament passages in the very beginning, scattered in to tonight. We are going to look at some Old Testament passages. If it perks your interest, uh, any at all and matters at all, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is highly controversial. And I realize that. And I think it's some waters that we need to wade into. And I'll talk to you about why. We've been walking through a series for quite some time on the three spheres of authority that God's instituted among men. And we've looked at the church, we've looked at the family, and now, for quite a while now, we've been looking at the government. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. Amen? Amen. So, there's not a your truth and then a my truth. There's only the truth. And so, there's also not particular spiritual areas or really any areas of life that scripture does not speak into in one way or the other to teach us about how Christ reigns and how we're to live. There are areas of life where scripture reveals more and less. But as Abraham Kuyper famously said, there's not one square inch in all of creation to which Jesus Christ does not cry mine. So we want to seek to see all of life from a biblical world view. And so we're looking now at the civil magistrate. And as a reminder, the purpose of the civil magistrate, the civil government, is twofold. It's to punish wrongdoers and to protect rightdoers. And God calls the government and its authority his servant. So let's look at a few passages that deal with this. And then I want to begin to wade into some deep waters that we need to be very, very careful with. And the reason why I want to do this now is because there's not some massive election that we're fixing to vote in. There's not some, I mean, we have plenty of crises in this country, but there's not some massive crisis mode that we're throwing ourselves in. I want to begin to help us think through these issues, no matter where you fall on these issues, and we will fall in different places in this room, and that's okay. What I want to do is now begin to help us to think through these issues before we're put in the position of having to respond without having thought carefully and biblically through the issue. Are you with me? So again, we're going to fall in different places and that's okay. Do not want to spark division. What I want to do is spark healthy dialogue and biblical thinking. So 1 Peter 2.13 says, are you there in your Bibles? Are you there at all? All right. Ain't that many of us in here. You can talk to me. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This will really make sense given the first point that I'll give you in just a few minutes. I want you to turn now in your Bibles to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Turn back. Make your way through the New Testament. We're going to look at Titus chapter 3, and then one other will land on Romans 13. So just a little bit of a sampling of the Scripture's instruction to us of how to live under the civil magistrate. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. If you're not there, just continue to turn. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. 
First Timothy 2, 2 says to pray for them that we might live peaceful, quiet, godly, dignified lives in every area, in every way. Turn to one other passage, if you would, the passage that maybe you would expect that we would need to land on. Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13. And I want to read verses one through seven. Let's walk through the entire passage, because as we walk through this, there are um, more difficult issues to work through than you might think on the surface. Romans 13 verse 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So, government's not a necessary evil. It's a blessing to represent His authority for human flourishing and should represent uh, the law of God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, okay? But to bad. Rulers are a terror to bad conduct. Are you with me? Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what's good, and you'll receive his approval. For he is God's servant, God's de- diaconized, God's servant for your good, in his hands, serving his good purposes. But if you do wrong, then be afraid. So I think I've mentioned this before. Me and my kids like to scare each other around the house. And we have a lot of fun with that, except for when the joke's on me and it's really late at night and uh, those little army men in cars are all in the floor. Those things are straight from hell. I'm convinced because you step on them in the middle of the night if the kids haven't picked them up. And sometimes I won't even be scaring the kids. Like, they'll just jump out of their skin. And I'll say, son, what's the matter? You got a guilty conscience? Why? (laughs) You got a guilty conscience or you're looking, you're waiting on something. You're afraid if you're doing something wrong. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God. An avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. This is the purpose of government. Carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We have a lot of different examples of godly rulers in the scriptures. We have Joseph and Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah and Mordecai. We have Moses. We also have our fair share of tyrants in scripture. You think of Jeroboam who invaded the worship of God's people. You think of Ahaz who invaded private property. You think of Herod, who invaded personal life. You think of Nebuchadnezzar. There are no shortage of tyrants who do the opposite of what we just read. So it's clear what we do. It's clear what honors God when, as Romans 13 says, rulers are a terror to bad conduct and when they are God's servants for good. But the question is, what are we to do when the government and the civil magistrate is the exact opposite of Romans 13's statement here. What about when the government is a terror to good conduct and a servant of evil? Well, thankfully, the church has already worked out this issue, for the most part, in church history. And nowhere, I think that we would all agree, nowhere in Romans 13 or any other passage do we find a call to unlimited obedience to any earthly authority. Unlimited obedience to any earthly authority. I think that we would all, everyone would agree to that. Everyone in the right mind. In the early 1900s, a man by the name of Francis Schaeffer, anyone heard of Francis Schaeffer? Really encourage you to read him. Very thoughtful, but also uh, approachable. He wrote a classic work called The Christian Manifesto. I recently went back and read this. Um, and he looks to the great Puritan Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford wrote a book called Lex Rex, um, The Law and the King. I highly recommend this to you. It's thicker. It will take you some time to get through. Uh, But this book uh, was one of the key works that our founders looked toward in setting up our own country. 
uh, Samuel Rutherford, a, a, a Puritan. We've also worked this out in Scottish history, post-Reformation, with the Scottish Covenanters. This is volume two of a work called The Covenanters. Uh, so uh, we have worked out this issue many times in the history of the church. We've worked it out through the French Huguenots who were persecuted, the Scott Calvinists who were persecuted, uh, through um, the Puritans. And unfortunately, this wasn't worked out in academic towers. This was worked out in the midst of crisis when people's lives were on the line. Well, Francis Schaeffer, looking to Samuel Rutherford, states, quote, Rutherford presents several arguments to establish the right and duty of resistance to unlawful government. First, since tyranny is satanic, not to resist it is to resist God. To resist tyranny is to honor God. Second, since the ruler is granted power conditionally, it follows that the people have the power to withdraw their sanction if the proper conditions are not fulfilled. So we've looked at this. We called this social covenant or social contract theory. You'll have to go back and watch the Wednesday night from a few weeks ago. He said the civil magistrate is a fiduciary figure. That is, he holds his authority and trust for the people. Violation of the trust gives the people a legitimate basis for resistance. So such civil obedience is required when they corrupt the worship and the gospel of Christ, but it's lawful before God in other areas as well. Now I want you to wrestle through this issue with me because this is not an easy, clear issue and we have to be extremely careful with it. I want to take you back to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. And I also want to remind you that I am not intending on Wednesday nights to walk through an exposition of Scripture of one verse. We do that on Sundays. This is where we just kind of bring everything together topically. And so if I have to argue every point that I make expositionally, you're going to be here till midnight. And I don't mind doing that. The question is, do you mind doing that? I want to take you back to the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. He was interested in church reform but Charles V was a dedicated Catholic. He did not want Protestantism in Europe. you got to listen to this. Given the emperor's opposition to Protestantism, they knew that it was only a time before he began to act against the Protestants. And so to prevent him from picking off the Protestant territories one at a time, they decided to form a defensive alliance should the emperor attack one of them, they would consider it an attack on all of them. So they did what a lot of Christians do, did during that time. They went to Martin Luther. And they asked Martin Luther's blessing on all of this, and Martin Luther refused. Luther argued on the basis of Romans 13 that we are to obey all governing powers, and therefore that the princes needed to obey the emperor. And he and if, asked, uh, if he asked them to do something that God prohibited or not to do something that God commanded, then they could exercise civil obedience, but not until. Obeying God in conscience and then accepting the consequences is what Luther said. And so what's ironic when Luther gave that advice is that he wasn't following his own advice. <laughs> Luther was hiding out for his life. He was fleeing from a government that was trying to kill him. He was resisting. He was not doing what he was told to do. So by fleeing, he was practicing civil disobedience, which he encouraged these people not to do. You say, well, Luther was just fleeing for his life, self-defense. Yeah, but Elector Frederick also was the one protecting Luther, and Luther never discouraged him from doing that. And so you see some conflicts here that are being worked out. Now, in Luther's mind, as he's telling them, Romans 13, shut your mouth and do what they say, he is living in a context where he has experienced what's called the Knights' Revolt and the German Peasants' War. Basically, you have a bunch of so-called believers rising up and just looking for reasons to rebel against the government. And it was a bloodbath. And Luther wanted nothing to do it, and he was right for wanting nothing to do with that. And so he was very fearful of social uprisings and anarchies, and the scriptures condemned that. He was sensitive to that given the context that he lived in. However, he condemned 
uh, in condemning this, some lawyers came to Luther about Romans 13. And they said that Romans 13 is certainly true, but it did not apply to their circumstances. And here's what these lawyers said to Luther. It didn't apply to the princes in the empire. First of all, he said that the princes in the empire were themselves governing authorities, governing authorities. So they were part of the powers that were in authority that God had placed into authority that were to be obeyed. So Luther's response was that God had placed the emperor over the princes, so it was the duty of the princes to obey the emperor and to do what he said. But the lawyer said, not so fast. The emperor himself was elected by the electors who represented the princes. This goes back to the doctrine of the lesser magistrates. Everyone whom is in a legitimate authority in the government, God has put there and given them authority. And these princes themselves had consented to the authority of the emperor. And therefore, the lawyers argued if the emperor should violate the law or break his word, it was not just their right to resist him. It was their legal responsibility to resist him. Luther listened to the arguments. He was persuaded. He said that he was wrong and that given a live situation, he began to say Romans 13 actually does not mean shut your mouth and do whatever they say and give them unlimited authority. In 1530, Martin Luther issued a memorandum and he said that if the, if the lawyers were correct about the constitution of the empire, if the princes were responsible under the law to lead resistance against an evil emperor, who was breaking the law or violating the law, then it was acceptable for these princes to resist him. And so hence we have the doctrine of lesser magistrates that I explained a few weeks ago, where you appeal to these lesser magistrates, governors, mayors, whatever, who have been given authority by God when a president, a Congress, when higher governing authorities are in defiance against the law of the land and the law of God. We appeal to those who are lesser to restore justice. This memorandum that Luther issued resulted in a Protestant alliance that has become quite faithful, and it laid the foundation for what the church has worked out during seasons of crisis and persecution called Protestant resistance theory. Protestant resistance theory. Now, like the reformers, I want to say we need to reject violence. We need to reject anarchy, rioting, looting, and chaos in the name of social change. That is not justified. That is not justified. We also need to realize that we live in a different political environment, and we have options to respond to threats from our government when they step outside the law of God and the constitution of our land, and we need to use those avenues. We also need to remember that the reformers didn't take action until they were threatened with war, and they had quite a bit of endurance and patience in that. Violent resistance was only triggered by the reformers when it was needed to defend the community out of love for neighbor, not out of love for self. And when there was resistance given, it, if at all possible, it was done in accordance with just war theory. And I'll make reference to that in a minute. What I'm trying to say is that what's going on right now is not new. There are a lot of believers, myself included, who for a long time read Romans 13 and just simply thought it meant shut your mouth and do whatever they say. And then you're confronted with a live situation and it causes you to go back and reevaluate your position. It's exactly what happened with Martin Luther. It's pretty much what we see happening with John MacArthur. And it's what we see happening in a lot of places. To consider the context that we live in and how best to faithfully apply the scriptures to it. This is what happened with our founding fathers when they were in Philadelphia. So... No human authority, no civil magistrate has absolute authority. And there will be times when faithful believers will be accused of being lawless and 
even committing treason. There's a pastor in Canada who's been in prison for meeting as a church lately, been in jail. And resistance to tyranny, it's important to remember, is not the same thing as resistance to the established civil order. If you want another example and you say, you recommend books all the time, I'm not reading a book. Fine, don't read a book. I want to encourage you, go home and watch the movie Cromwell. Write it down right now, Cromwell. It will take you back to the English Civil War and I think present a beautiful biblical picture of the posture that Christians ought to have. We have watched that this week and really enjoyed it as a learning experience in our family. And it's just a reminder that what we've seen happen in our country over the last year is nothing new. It goes back and retells the story, not in a documentary, but more of a story, a movie of Oliver Cromwell, Charles I in England, and the serious tyranny of Charles I as a result of Oliver Cromwell and then what was put in place after Oliver Cromwell died. England's never been the same since for good, but it was a very difficult issue to navigate. And it was not clear cut. What I want to give you is some clear cut principles tonight. First of all, I want to give you this principle and I want you to note it. As it pertains to the government and as it pertains to the government stepping outside their lane and their boundaries, our default position, our default posture should be one of respectful submission to governing authorities. We should be eager to submit ourselves to the governing authorities as God's servant for good. And even when we cannot yield, even when we cannot say, I'm going to help pay for abortion through our tax dollars, we're going to close our churches, I'm going to close my business. Even when we say, I cannot do that, still our heart's position is, we want to. Don't put us in this situation, please. Our heart's position is not, I dare you. I dare you. Are you following with me so far? So I want to position us, if we're not already as a church, to have a posture of respectful submission to governing authorities. We see the paying of taxes. We see registering in census. But we also see in Scripture the Hebrew midwives who refused to kill the children. We see Daniel who refused to stop praying daily. Esther, who refused to go along with plots against her people. Jonathan, who resisted the king, who, by the way, was also his own daddy to protect David. The apostles who refused to quit preaching the word of God. And we could go on and on and on. And our founding fathers have put things in place that would hopefully help honor the teachings of Scripture and the doctrines of Scripture like a separation and balance of powers, like the consent of the governed, like the representation of the people, things like innocent and proven guilty with a proper trial and with witnesses. Just because in a Me Too movement, you say that someone's guilty does not mean that they're guilty and it does not matter if it's in the Washington Times or not. Innocent until proven guilty with a proper trial and witnesses is what we see in the law of God in Deuteronomy. The opportunity for a redress of grievances, things like limited government, things like unalienable rights that are given by God and protected by the government. Things like an energetic executive, a bicameral legislature with a Senate and a House, an independent judiciary that's not enslaved to the other branches. All of these things are put in place by our founders as an experiment to try to honor the doctrines of Scripture and the things that it teaches. And so we have a constitutional democratic republic. It was also intended from the very beginning in Scripture through our founding that everything that could be handled on a local level, we would handle on a local level. I think that we need to stop giving so much attention to national and federal politics and start worrying more about what's going on around us locally. In our churches, in our families, in Wetumpka, right around us. That's the principle of subsidiarity. Look in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 18. In Exodus chapter 18 with Moses and Jethro, we see some seeds that are put in place that would later develop 
through the Old Testament of things like due process, of accountability, of appeal, of the representation to, uh, of the people, the right to answer an accusation. We see in the law of God, restitution for theft. We see retribution. We see all of these different principles. And as we apply these principles, we have to be good students of God's word. We do not live now under the old covenant in the Old Testament. So what we do when we read about the law of God in the Old Testament is we wisely take the general principles that are represented there and then we try to faithfully apply those through the lens of Christ in our setting. But the principles remain the same. We need to remember this. We need to remember this because the government never wastes a good crisis. They never waste a good opportunity to create a good crisis and they never waste a good crisis. And what happens when the government steps in is the same thing that happens when the church steps in to take up the slack in the family to do things that the family should be doing. The government steps in or the church steps in to fill a void and what happens is they almost never step out. They almost never step out. And so they continue to exercise the authority that they were never given and they cannot do the job that they should do. They make a mess of it because they're doing something they weren't intended to do. It's not the government's job to be mama and daddy to us and to take care of us. That's our job. Their job is to punish evil and protect good. Protect good. We live on the other side of the progressive era, what's called the administrative state, and things have gone haywire. In all of this, nonetheless, if there's anybody on the planet that's a people of honor and respect and submission in faithfully posturing ourselves to obey authority, it ought to be us in every way that we can. Number two, second... As much as the situation will allow, we attempt to endure the weaknesses, shortcomings, and sin of our civil magistrates. Have you realized that God has instituted authority among men and every single one of those authorities are imperfect? Wives are to submit to imperfect husbands. Children are to honor and obey imperfect parents. Church members are to submit to And all of God's people can say amen. Imperfect pastors. Imperfect pastors. And citizens, and we're citizens, not subjects, because we participate in the political process. You understand the difference between those two, right? We submit to imperfect congresses, presidents, mayors, governors. And so we endure as much as we can the shortcomings, weaknesses, and sins of our civil magistrates. And in the meantime, in our government, we're allowed the opportunity to have a redress of grievances. In other words, to express our concerns, to educate people around us like I'm trying to do tonight. Like the conversations we try to have with each other. Uh, We can contact our congressmen. Um, We can have a say through the voting process. We can turn to the courts and sue. We'll talk about that in Corinthians, but we do. We, we can turn to the courts. We can turn to our lesser magistrates. There's things that we can do in the meantime. Now, there are times when we can't endure. And let me give you just one example, and there's a, a bunch of them. If the government tries to come and take my children, and I'm in the right, and they're clearly in the wrong, I'm not enduring nothing. <laughs> I'm protecting my children. I'm protecting my children. Somebody comes in my house at night and I'm not going to endure them. I will shoot them and then I'll endure them and pray for them when I get done. And I think that the scriptures teach this from beginning to end, self-defense. And we'll look at that. But as much as possible, we attempt to endure the weaknesses, shortcomings and sin of our civil magistrates. The only person that thinks I'll, I'll rephrase that. When you look at what's going on in our founding fathers, You have two groups of people sitting in Philadelphia. You have some that are ready to pull the trigger and resist because they see what's coming. You have others in the American War for Independence who are saying, no, give it time. Try to bargain with the king. Try to try. 
And then you got others saying, that's getting us nowhere. We're getting farther in slavery. And then there's this back and forth. Are you with me? And we feel it now. This even in this church, some resist now, some wait. We feel it in our country. Short trigger, long trigger. And what happened when the Declaration of Independence was written is they were not only already shooting people in our own country, they were quartering troops in our homes, taking the life of our children and sending boats over here right now to destroy us. So in 1776, we had endured about as much weaknesses, shortcomings, and sin over a period of about six to 15 years as we could, as we could. Third, seek to appeal to lesser magistrates. Seek to appeal to lesser magistrates as much as the situation will allow. John Knox, how many of you have heard of John Knox? John Knox had a very interesting conversation with a lady, nonetheless, whose name was Queen Mary. The trumpet blast. John Knox said to Mary, Daniel did pray publicly unto his God against the express commandment of the king. And so, madam, you may perceive that subjects are not bound to the religion of their princes, although they're commanded they give them obedience. Queen Mary fired back to John Knox. Yeah, but none of these men raised the sword against their princes. John Knox said, yes, madam, you can't deny that they... Uh, you cannot deny that they res- resisted for those who obey not the commandments that are given in some sort resist. Queen Mary said, but yet they resisted not by the sword. And John Knox said, God, Madam had not given them the power and the means to resist with the sword. They had no, ch- no choice. Queen Mary said, think you that subjects having the power may resist their princes? If I could be a fly on the wall in history, this would be it. Let's just say this man had some courage. John Knox said, if their princes exceed their bounds, madam, no doubt they may be resisted even by power. For there is neither greater honor nor greater obedience to be given to kings or princes than God has commanded to be given unto father and mother. Listen to the illustration. But the father may be stricken with a frenzy in which he would slay his children. Let's say a father goes on a rampage to kill his children. If the children arise, join themselves together and apprehend the father and take the sword from his hand and bind his hands and keep him in prison till his frenzy be overpassed. Do you think, madam, that the children have done any wrong? What do you think? Have they done any wrong? Knox said, it is even so, madam, with princes that would murder the children of God that are subjects unto them. Their blind zeal is nothing but a very, very mad frenzy. And therefore, to take the sword from them, to bind their hands and to cast them into prison till they be brought to a more sober mind is no disobedience against princes, but just obedience because it agrees with the will of God. I'm going to give you homework because I have the right to do that. Your your homework is to go home and watch Cromwell. Go and watch Cromwell. And you're going to see what John Knox is saying played out in real life. So we begin by appealing, number three, to lesser magistrates. And I've explained this. We see this in 2 Kings 11 with the priest Jehoiada, who stepped in with authority to deal with the tyrannical government. Number four. Number four. Fourth, we appeal to self-defense. We appeal to self-defense. When and if, God forbid, never, but when and if, put in the situation. Now, I want to be very clear. We do not seek vengeance. We do not seek vengeance. We leave vengeance to who? To God. We pray for our enemies and we trust them to God. But the people also have a power in the consent of the governed. And you see this pattern throughout the Old Testament. And I'll stay here with you and show it to you till midnight if you want me to. First Samuel 14, 45. The people raise up to save the innocent among them. In our country, we have a right to bear arms, which is a representation of the right to self-defense. Because of the doctrine of the Imago Dei, the image of God, the sanctity of human life, we're charged to protect innocent human life. Obviously, there's a difference when we're talking about capital punishment. That's a whole other issue. But innocent human life in the sense that a crime has not been committed, even if a sin has. Number five. 
Now, we realize that Christ and the gospel are more worthy than our lives. And we have a record of martyrs who give up their physical lives and can no longer protect themselves or choose not to protect themselves. But the default setting throughout the scriptures is that it is understood that naturally we protect our own human life. It's a natural response. Ephesians 5, 29, Luke 12, 39, Matthew 24, 43, our expected response in life is to preserve life beginning with our own and not to take it. Luke twenty two thirty six. the disciples were assumed to be carrying swords. Nehemiah chapter 4, they're protecting themselves while they build the wall. Zechariah 9, 8, 2 Samuel 10, 12. I can do this all night. We see examples of David, of Jesus, of Paul fleeing from governing authorities. If you are fleeing from a governing authority, that means you are not submitting to them and that means you are resisting them. You are resisting them. So there are circumstances in which this can be lawful. Scripture is clear, however, that we do not take up the sword to advance the gospel. We don't take up the sword to advance the gospel. Are you with me? We take up the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. That's the only thing that advances the gospel. But to preserve human life, there are times when this happens. Jesus told Peter to put a sword up, but Peter didn't understand that Jesus' will was to go to the cross. Now, number five. Number five. We'll have to come back to this next time. Maybe this will be a bit of a cliffhanger. I don't know. Maybe you won't want to come back, but I encourage you to. Fifth, we resist illegitimate authority. We resist illegitimate authority. I'm out of time because I want to pray. But what I plan to do next week is to finish up this series by looking at church history and the scriptures to show how we can know when the time comes and what it looks like when we do need to submit to God by resisting the civil magistrate. And then we'll talk about how ultimately we entrust ourselves to the Lord. It's not a very good place to stop, but I don't want to get into those waters. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we pray for our governing authorities that you help them to rule righteously, to preserve human life, not to take it. We pray for the end of abortion. We pray that you give us courage to stand in the midst of a sexual revolution. Father, we pray that we would love your law. We pray that you would save our governing leaders. We pray that you would create strong, healthy communities right here around us. We pray your blessings on fathers and mothers and children, families. We pray your blessings on our church. That we would take the gospel by taking up the word of God. We would see health beginning with salvation. Father, we pray for our local authorities, our national authorities, that you give them wisdom. Lord, help them to carry the significant weight on their shoulders. Father, guide them. Give them strength and rest this evening. Help them to do what's right. We pray for governing authorities right here tonight who can't sleep, who have heavy decisions ahead of them that we don't know about. And they're concerned about doing the right thing and facing consequences or doing the wrong thing and going with the flow. Lord, we pray that you give them courage. Help others to stand with them. Help us to be submissive to them and to use every legitimate means. And Father, help us to be wise when and if put in situations where civil disobedience would be faithfulness. Father, help us to bear with one another in love as a church. We're inevitably going to have different positions on this, some waiting longer, some acting sooner. Father, I pray that you do a work in our lives and prepare us by learning to think biblically now. Learning to apply the scriptures in our life right now in whatever situations we find ourselves in. And just being faithful to you. And ultimately, Lord, we entrust ourselves to you. We don't worry about our lives. We want to be faithful, but we entrust our lives to you. We know that the government, all of our representatives are in your hands and you guide their hearts like the water course. Oh, Lord, we take such joy in knowing that tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.